<laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay, we we might give this just another five minutes, just in case that uh, just in case people have struggled to join with that earlier link. So let's start at quarter past eleven. Um, um, Adam Mar Markham, who was meant to be joining us today, is unfortunately without uh, internet or electricity following a hurricane in oh. the eastern United States. So he won't be able to join us today anyway. So we have a little bit of, of extra time. Um, it's good news. Scott, you're back. Good. And I think you can probably hear me now too. Yes, indeed. Good to have that confirmed. Very good to have that confirmed.
Okay, um, hello everybody and good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I am, uh, hope you can hear me and hopefully see a slide which I have sharing screen at the moment. Um, uh, Scott, could I get a thumbs up if you can both see and hear me? Super, I can see you, so that's why I'm asking you. Thank you very much. Okay, so welcome, 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 everybody. Um, this webinar will run for the next uh, two hours, and um, as many of us are having connection issues, I think it's quite likely that people will join us and come in and out um, as the webinar goes on, uh, which is absolutely fine. It is being recorded. Um, and the purpose for that will we'll explain uh, what this webinar is about shortly. If I could ask people, please, to um, uh, turn off their cameras if they are not speaking or presenting, and even if they are speaking or presenting, if they are having connection issues, to, they can also turn off cameras if that is the easiest th way to do it. Um, as uh, I am adminning this call. I may also have to mute people if there is a lot of background noise, and I hope that uh, people will understand uh, if I have to uh, to do that. Um, we very much hope to have uh, Mercy uh, uh, Goble and Mugumba, Rebel Campus Mugumba, with us today, and they are they will be joining us shortly. I hope, um, but um, if we just in the until they do, I just like to say a few words um, of uh, of welcome, and um, and just give a little bit of an introduction uh, to what we are doing here uh, today. So. Um, Firstly, I would like to explain and introduce our project to you, especially those who are not familiar to it, and um, before doing some welcomes and introductions, um, and then we will get into some of the presentations which we are going to hear today. So this webinar is part of the CVI Africa project, which is a project exploring the vulnerability of African World Heritage Properties to Climate Change. It's funded by the United Kingdom Department of Culture, Media and Sport and the Arts and Humanities Research Council and involves partners from four different continents, uh, maybe five, um, which is why we have to start every meeting with uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening because we're all over the world, which is also one of the most exciting things about this project. The CVI Africa project um, has two key goals. The first is to uh, collate training resources um, on topics including climate change, uh, heritage management, uh, vulnerability assessment, and to use these to run a 10-week training course uh, for a group of six heritage professionals um, from the continent of Africa. And this course has now completed, and it's lovely to have many of our, uh, our heritage professionals here with us on this webinar today, and welcome. The second part of the CVI Africa course uh, is to run a vulnerability assessment called uh, uh, the CVI, the Climate Vulnerability Index, at two African World Heritage sites. And these are the ruins of Kilwa Kisawani and the ruins of Songo Menara in Tanzania, which is what we will be talking about today, and also the Sukur cultural landscape uh, in Nigeria. Now, this webinar is part of the process for the ruins of Kilwa Kisawani CVI. Ideally, this process would happen in person, um, but due to the ongoing global pandemic, this is not possible. So instead, we are having some of these webinars online to collect information to feed into uh, this uh, process of the CVI, which uh, Dr. Scott Heron will explain to us shortly. And this format does raise some challenges. And so I just like to go over uh, some of 
how today will work. Uh, the first is that, um, as I said before, this webinar will last for two hours and there will hopefully be time for a question and answer at the end. Um, with these connection issues, it might be that some of our participants or our speakers may not be able to contribute as clearly as they would like. Um, and if this is the case, uh, presentations are also going to be submitted and we can share this information with people separately. Um, also, due to the time differences, it has not been possible for everybody to join us in person. And so some of the presentations, uh, specifically the presentation by Dr. Brenda Quirzel from the Union of Concerned Scientists will be a video, which she pre-recorded as part of our training course. Um, I've already said as connection is likely to be an issue, uh, can I please ask people to make sure that their uh, cameras are switched off unless they are speaking? Um, and also pre present people presenting might choose to use presentations or they might not, depending on their preferences. So um, before we, 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 I ask Scott to introduce the CVI process, um, allow me please first to welcome everybody um, to welcome those of you who I do know and also those of you who I have not met before. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, I've already welcomed our training participants. Um, I'd also like to welcome uh, distinguished members of the CVI Sucre uh, Steering Committee, uh, who some of whom are with us today. You are very, very welcome. And also to our invited speakers, um, for whom I'd like to provide a little bit more of an introduction um, before we start. Our first speaker today will be uh, Dr. Scott Heron, who is uh, Associate Professor in Physics at James Cook University in Australia, um, where his research focuses on climate impacts on marine and coastal environments. And alongside another colleague, Dr. John Day, he has developed the CVI method we are applying in this project. Following Dr. Heron's talk, we had hoped to have a talk from Dr. Adam Markham, who unfortunately cannot be with us today due to technical and connected issues. Um, but we will also then have a talk from Dr. Brenda Equerzel, uh, who is the Senior Climate Scientist uh, and Director of Climate Science for the Climate and Energy Programme at the Union of Concerned Scientists, and was co-author of the fourth National Climate Assessment in Volume 2. And she will be presenting on a kind of wider climate modelling for the continent of Africa. We're also very pleased today to have Mr. Everest Abraham, who's a Tanzanian climate scientist who has been working very hard for us in downscaling climate impacts to this site. And he has been working with uh, his colleague, Dr. Noah Makula from the University of Dar es Salaam. So welcome, Mr. Abraham. And finally, then we're also very honored to have Professor uh, Donateus Kamamba, uh, who is an architect and part-time lecturer at the University of Dar es Salaam. Um, he is a uh, retired and director of antiquities in Canada, in Tanzania, and is also a member, uh, was also a member of the ICOMOS Management Committee and a council member of ICROM for very years and was very involved in adaptation activities at the site um, of Kilwa Kisawani. So that is our wonderful lineup of speakers today. You are all very, well, very welcome. Thank you for coming. And I would like to pass over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Scott Heron, who is going to uh, provide just a little bit of an overview um, of the CVI methodology and why this webinar is so important. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, could you please confirm that you can see my shared screen? I can indeed, yes. Thank you. So uh, as Will mentioned, I'll be introducing the Climate Vulnerability Index, the CVI, uh, and this is, as also mentioned, uh, a tool that's been developed together with uh, my colleague John Day, and uh, we're very delighted to be presenting this uh, and have this opportunity to speak with you today. Many of the people uh, online in the webinar at the moment will be familiar with these concepts, uh, and we welcome all uh, who will be seeing this both uh, live and in recording fashion. Climate change. 
uh, has been identified as a key threat to areas of heritage, both cultural and natural, all around the world and by several organisations uh, for whom heritage is an important factor. Uh, and that is unveiled in uh, heat stress, both in the water and on land, storms, like we've just been hearing one of our colleagues has experienced uh, recently, sea level rise and impacts, uh, wildfire conditions and intense precipitation and associated impacts. Uh, one of the key things that John and I had noted that whilst climate change had been identified as a key threat, there did not appear to be a systematic method uh, to be able to evaluate the vulnerability to climate change of locations of heritage and specifically world heritage that was systematic and repeatable. So we took upon this as a challenge to develop a, a rapid assessment tool for climate vulnerability that could be consistently applied to a number of types of properties, most specifically for all types of world heritage properties. It needs to be needed to be systematic, but not too complex. And it needed to be actionable now rather than awaiting for perhaps we could say more irreversible climate impacts. Um, importantly for World Heritage, uh, the tool uh, was desired to put these climate impacts into the context of the other cumulative pressures that are impacting heritage. We also note that this tool, whilst developed specifically for World Heritage, uh, can be applied to other types of uh, formal and informal protected areas. And so we arrived at the CVI, the Climate Vulnerability Index, which is a values-based, science-driven and community-focused rapid assessment tool for climate impacts on heritage. In terms of the first of those key phrases, values-based, this first involves identifying the values uh, by which we use the foundational document for World Heritage Properties, which is the Statement of Outstanding Universal Value. Uh, we also note that for non-World Heritage Properties, there is usually a foundational document that can be used in the same fashion to derive key World Heritage values. However, we also recognise that uh, whilst World Heritage uh, will we'll see the uh, values that are universally outstanding, that highest level of standard, uh, there may be other property values that are significant at a local or a regional or national level or even an international level, but aren't uh, described within the foundational document. And whilst those aren't at that high international level recognised by the statement of inscription, uh, it's important to recognise that these are important values and that they are also being affected by climate change. To give you one example, uh, and this is selected from a natural World Heritage property inscribed for all four World Heritage natural criteria. Uh, the Shark Bay, Western Australia World Heritage property had these uh, different uh, identified key values of which the first of those, seagrass, was identified to be a foundational value. And what we mean by that is that other identified key values rely upon uh, the persistence and the health of uh, that first uh, seagrass value. The process is science driven. The initial framework that we used was based on uh, a framework, a vulnerability approach from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in their third and fourth assessment reports. And you can see that on the screen in front of you. We modified this to uh, apply to the outstanding universal value and to assess the vulnerability of that. So using the natural and or cultural values. 
But more than this, we added on uh, a, a concept of modifiers in which the measures of exposure and sensitivity can be further refined and considered as a part of the analysis. The final addition was to repeat that same framework structure where the OUV vulnerability now becomes the exposure term to look at impacts on the community. And we do that by assessing the sensitivity and the adaptive capacity of the economic, social and cultural components that are associated with the property of interest. All this together is considered as the CVI process. We compiled from various sources a list of climate stresses that were uh, likely to be apparent at a great majority of World Heritage properties. And you can see those listed in the colored sections down the left-hand side of the page. However, there's also space within the CVI process to bring in other context-specific stresses. And that's in the white section in the lower left. And you can see there some examples that may not be typically applicable to many World Heritage sites, but can be incorporated uh, as is needed, and others indeed can be incorporated as is needed with the process. The analysis from these climate stresses is again science driven. We look in the upper right hand diagram at historical climate variables and what has occurred in recent history and in longer history based on these data sets. Further to that, as shown in the lower right-hand panel, we look to climate projections. And of course, we're all aware that the IPCC has recently released their sixth assessment report, uh, the summary and the full report from Working Group One, looking at the climate science. So here again, we, we, we place as foundational in this process, uh, the science that is underpinning all of the CVI analysis. The second of those key terms after values based uh, was science driven and the final one now community focused. Here we undertake an analysis of economic, social and cultural connections with the property. The economic considerations look at business types directly associated with the property of interest. The social aspect here looks at uh, various types of visitors who have come and experienced the property or who reside uh, within or near to the property. The final of these sectors, the cultural sector, looks at all types of cultural connections, uh, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, uh, and looking at uh, those associations with the property. Importantly, we assess the ESC, Economic, Social, Cultural Dependency Term, which looks towards the future, the future effect of key climate stresses on the ESC components. Whilst the adaptive capacity considers only the capacity that exists at the present time to adapt in the face of a loss of World Heritage values due to those key climate stresses. We apply the CVI looking at these assessments for exposure, sensitivity, adaptive capacity leading to the OUV vulnerability, and then the ESC dependency and ESC adaptive capacity leading to the community vulnerability using a risk matrix approach, whereby the exposure and sensitivity terms through the risk matrix give us an assessment of the potential impact, which then combines through another matrix approach with the adaptive capacity to indicate the OUV vulnerability. In turn, that combines with the assessment of the ESC dependency through a, a further risk matrix to, uh, to assess the ESC potential impact, which is combined with the ESC adaptive capacity to provide an output for the community vulnerability for the property. 
It's important to recognise that the CVI does do uh, some key things. It does provide a broad assessment. It does consider key climate stresses and examine the World Heritage property as a whole. Through the process and through the information exchanged in the workshops and the consults and the snapshots, uh, the CVI process will help the participants point to knowledge gaps and areas needing further investigation and to raise awareness and issues for future consideration. However, it's also important to recognise that the CVI does not undertake a detailed or a deep dive analysis. It does not, because it's a rapid assessment process, assess all of the climate stresses, only focusing on the identified top three key climate stresses. The CVI process doesn't undertake detailed analysis of individual elements of the World Heritage property, nor does it delve into new research areas that are identified. The CVI doesn't pretend nor uh, state that it should provide all of the solutions, but bringing these needs to the fore is a key part of the CVI process. To give you an example of uh, some outputs from the CVI process, here we see uh, the assessed exposure in the orange row, sensitivity in the green row for three, the three identified key climate stresses, temperature trend, extreme temperature events, and sea level rise. Those assessments combine to give the three measures of potential impact in the purple row, which combined with the, uh, the uh, assessed adaptive capacity in the blue row lead to the measures of OUV vulnerability. And overall for this property, uh, the overall assessed OUV vulnerability was at a high level. This is then fed into the assessments for the economic, social and cultural. And again, we see a dark green, a lighter purple, a darker blue, and our uh, red row in the bottom of the second table, the community vulnerability. To give you a picture of uh, what climate stresses have been identified in past natural and cultural uh, applications, uh, you can see here for Shark Bay, uh, these were the three identified key climate stresses. And for the heart of Neolithic Orkney uh, application in the very north of Scotland, uh, there were, was one overlap with two uh, unique stresses identified. For the Wadden Sea, these were the three stresses uh, that were identified, overlapping with each of the two prior applications. And most recently in Edinburgh, uh, we again saw an overlap of key climate stresses identify. As stated already, we're currently working on the CVI Africa project uh, with the funding body acknowledged there and pointing to our two CVI workshops that we will be undertaking uh, in uh, Kilwa Kisawani, as we are discussing, and the Sukur cultural landscape in Nigeria. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, show to you that some of our history is documented in these update newsletters, which are regularly put out three times a year and uh, give some background information on the development of the CVI as well as applications around the world. And we acknowledge all of our contributors and collaborators, present and past, uh, as well as other folks involved in the process. Thank you very much, Will. Great, um, Scott, thank you very much for that overview um, of the CVI uh, process. Um, uh, for this site and for this CVI project, what we are doing in the absence of being able to meet together is uh, having a series of these webinars focusing on individual aspects of the CVI process. And this webinar is focused uh, specifically 
on the question of climate science and climate stressors. Um, uh, and this is why we are so fortunate to have such a range of experts with us today. I'd like to, before going on and, and playing the video from Dr. Kruzel, uh, just acknowledge some, some people who have just arrived. Um, I saw that Dr. Noah Pauline from the University of Dar es Salaam was with us briefly, but he might have dropped off the call, but just to say welcome. Um, thank you for coming. And also a very, very important part of this CVI process. Um, uh, Mercy Mugable, who's just joined us as well. Um, Mercy, welcome. How are you? Okay, Mercy might not have joined audio yet, but we certainly, Mercy is a key part of this process and has been one of the most important and supportive partners in this. So uh, it's wonderful uh, to have her here with us. What I'm going to do now is share the video from Dr. Uh, um, uh This will hopefully come up on your screen and you should be able to hear it play. Um, if you cannot, please let me know. I'm going to press play now. Um, and so if you don't hear anything in a few seconds time, please let me know, but you should be able to see this video and hear it as well. Just by way of background to this, uh, Dr. Krizel created this video for our CVI training course. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, and what she, we asked her to do was to look um, at the broader climate trends globally, but also then in the context of the, conference, of the continent of Africa. And what is hoped is that this presentation will contextualize then the following presentation, which will be by Mr. Abraham looking specifically um, at our area uh, of interest. So I'm going to play this now. And if you don't hear any noise, please let me know. As, as you know, we are gonna be doing a climate science overview. A lot of this is review uh, for many of you, but I, there are some surprises I think there's aspects of climate change that aren't as often conveyed. And as a climate scientist, I think it's really important to understand the mechanisms and why this is happening. Some general principles that apply many different places. And I'll use examples throughout different parts of um, Africa. So let's, let's go forward here. So here is um, the overview. And this is obviously for the CVI um, training. And so the two sites that we're leading up to are the Sukor Cultural Landscape and Kilo Kiswani. And um, just wanted to um, think about some of the figures and graphs from the scientific um, assessments, thinking about where these two sites exist, but also where many of the stories you were just sharing um, and where those are happening and causing uh, migration, people to move, um, lack of water or too much water is one of the uh, unfortunate signatures of climate change. So we're gonna go through that. So uh, here is a cartoon from a temperate climate example, just to remind everyone the difference between weather, uh, which um, you know the forecasters and the meteorologists tell us what to wear each day and in this temperate climate for this cartoon here by um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, for climate, it's kind of what are the clothes that you've purchased and spent money on or made yourself um, that you have in your closet so that you can get through a year living in this climate uh, of where you are dwelling or if you travel to another climate. So that's the difference between weather and climate. And this other aspect of climate variability is exactly what um, any season within the same place um, can have a dry period. Uh, it can have a wetter period. It can have a slightly wet, less wet period uh, over the course of a year or between years, your dry period may be a little bit different now. Um, in some years, and that's natural climate variability. And there are these cycles that happen because of the ocean, the atmosphere, and how our world works in the climate system. So that's climate variability, completely natural. Although this is changing as well with climate change. Um, and that next is, of course, climate change. So that means we can see the effects of climate change just in the stories you were sharing. 
And here's some examples of loss of ice from our high mountain areas, the glaciers, and in the coastal areas, uh, the rise in sea level shown on the bottom. So over time, we start seeing that the glaciers are shrinking and the seas are rising. And that is getting uh, both those signatures are continuing that trend. And we know that we have climate change. And some of this is really irreversible. The level of sea level rise we have right now, we cannot turn back for a very, very, very long time in human history in the future or this planet. So uh, to recap what we just said, as everyone knows, weather is really the type of forecasts that are changing on the scale of hours, uh, days, or weeks. And then we have climate variability, which we celebrate um, the passing of a, a, another year. Uh, so several years to, to basically decades is climate variability scale. And climate change is happening over decades and over centuries. So let's, let's look at what's happening in the continent of Africa and the ocean surrounding this amazing part of the world. <clears throat> and what I'm going to show you is some history of the climate that has already changed. We already have changed our world. It's already hotter. The seas are higher. The rain patterns are changing. And, and, and what do the latest, greatest um, projections for the future what does that uh, portend? And with cultural landscapes, what would we be planning for? So here's the history of temperature. Um, this is from the 1880s to the present, and these are decades. And we can see the decadal averages. 2020 ended the hottest decade on record. And we know that's because atmospheric carbon dioxide is increasing and it's trapping heat and we are warming our world. Now what's often lost in those graphs is we, we have to look, it's, it's not changing the same everywhere. So this is from uh, the Nat National Atmospheric and Space Administration, NASA, looking at what is the departure of the annual temperature in the year 1920. And the reason I picked this year is earlier years in this data set, there's large data gaps in the continent of Africa. So right now it's down to this area of the gray, uh, that the data gap. So this is the change in temperature for the year 1920, the average over compared to the baseline historical period for these graphs is 1951 and 1980. And what you'll see is this is degrees Celsius, departure from the average. It's white is you're close to the same, but if a cooler colors, it's cooler than this average. And the um, warmer colors, it's warmer than the average in the year 1920. So we can already see that the climate is changing from the historical period in the year 1920. In general, it's cooler. Now looking at the same historical period, we have to increase our scale here. You'll need, notice it changes to 6.4 degrees Celsius, still the same bottom scale, but you don't see as many cool colors in the year 2020, which is the last full year of record that NASA could create this graph. And you'll see that in parts of Africa are warming faster than the global average. And other parts are pretty much, um, the, glow, the average is gonna be white. Most of the world is warmer than this historical period. The Arctic region, much, much warmer. Parts of Antarctica, much warmer. But another pattern you will see is the land areas are warming faster than the ocean areas at the surface. So that's at the surface temperature. What's hidden in this, even though land is warming faster than the ocean, is something that is less talked about in climate change, but it really is profound if you have cultural sites that are in the ocean. So this is really, this is a strange uh, unit on the vertical, but um, zero is um, your baseline here of change. Um, since, you know, the, the 70s, and we're going through time to, the, to approaching the present, how much heat, we've been trapping heat in the atmosphere, 
how much heat is going into, this is energy and its heat content is accumulating since the 70s into the upper ocean. Most of it is accumulating in the upper ocean. This is the upper 700 meters in this graph. The next highest heat content is in the deeper ocean. And then you see this tiny sliver here is the ice on the planet. And then this next tiny sliver is where a lot of us are living and working and, and uh, spending time with our families and friends is this land portion. And the atmosphere is even harder to see, even though that's the big culprit. That's what's trapping heat and causing all this change. It itself is not um, storing that heat. The storage is happening in the ocean, which means what we've locked in when we dial in a temperature, it stays because our ocean is so hot and it gives heat back into the atmosphere. So it's really changing our world. This is very scary as a climate scientist because it's very hard to back this away. We have undeniable uh, sea level rise because of this heat content and warming, which I'll show you at the end. Really quick, so think about cultural heritage sites in this upper ocean, this upper 700 meters, and the amount of heat content that that artifact, um, the heritage that is in there, and what that is being experiencing. Now, the deeper ocean, um, perhaps not as many artifacts. I took a deep, deeper fish, um, but that's you know buffering us against the the warming. Now, in the ice, even though it's a small heat content, as we heard dramatic changes in the mountains of Africa. Here's an example from Kilimanjaro and even some of these glaciers taken in 1975, the satellite photo, some of them are no longer existing on the summit of Kilimanjaro. Now the land where a lot of our sites and historic sites are, um, this is heating up and you'll see, we know from the surface temperature, this is the fastest area that's warming. So. That was the past. This is the climate change this site has experienced to date. And we can look at the, the history from 1950 and look forward in time. And this is a high emission scenario in this uh, color here, in the warmer color, the reds. And, and, uh, and what we see is that the potential for warming could be at the end of the century on this current high emissions pathway, anywhere between three degrees Celsius and over five degrees Celsius warmer than kind of what our period was in the 2000s. Now the Paris Agreement is closer to this climate scenario. The blue, you can think about um, the type of change that the world is trying to keep. So every time you look at these graphs, you look at the blue one, think about this is what international agreements are striving, the Paris Climate Agreement, are striving to achieve. So the global mean surface temperature is compared to this historical average. Now, global mean surface temperature of the sea, the sea surface temperature is also projected to increase. It's more closer to two to you know, four degrees Celsius. And again, in the Paris Agreement scenario, we would keep it closer to today's levels, but still warmer. We still have to have some warming that, that is locked in. So let's just quickly compare global mean surface temperature, global mean sea surface temperature, but there's also these marine heat waves, which are really important for coral reefs, for example, that cause bleaching when you have too much heat compared to what they're adapted to in the temperature. And these heat waves are happening more frequently in projected in the future compared to what we've already experienced with corals, which is quite devastating in many parts of the world and some of the coral reefs off of Africa, especially some of the long chain coral reefs. I think it's the second largest. So, and this is what we saw before the ocean heat content. What's important to remember is that the land is warming faster than the sea surface temperature. However, you're gonna have some hot marine heat waves and the ocean is taking up most of the heat content, the deep ocean. So it's affecting cultural heritage sites. So that was um, temperature. Let's recap what the climate change history was in precipitation and see what uh, some of the future is, just from basic principles in this case. And um, 
checking on, on, on the thing about precipitation is in general with climate change, if you live in an area that receives rain certain times of the year, you may see that it's changing the timing or how long your rainy season is. One thing that does change is the characteristic of the rain. Sometimes it'd be too much rain or not, not as much rain. But in general, you may have changes with climate change, even if you have the same volume of rain over the course of a, a um, year, but it may be delivered in more intense rain events. Um, and, and that's a pattern we see. And in other parts, if you live in an area where it typically doesn't get as much rain or the dry season, you are now experiencing most likely drier and in even more um, drought conditions. So when we kind of say it's not totally perfect, but wet places are getting wetter, dry places are getting drier because we are really changing the hydrologic cycle. And here's some of the basic principles of why that's happening. And this has real um, consequences for places such as in Togo here, um, we see an earthen structure that has, um, you know, materials from the landscape being used. And you can imagine that when there's more intense precipitation in this region, such structures uh, would receive uh, damaging um, to, to, to them. So that is in Togo. Think about these maps here, uh, Syed et al. published in the journal Atmosphere. Um, these things that are looking at the changes in very extreme um, precipitation, also temperature. And you can see that um, in general, you're, you're changing the extremes in parts of the, the region that um, bring precipitation to parts of, of, of the areas and it will be more intense. So let's look at this in terms of the Paris Climate Agreement. This is the probability ratio of heavy precipitation as a function of global warming. So how much degrees Celsius above pre-industrial are we going uh, is what the Paris Agreement. So that's in terms of global mean surface temperature. And this is this probability ratio. So this blue line is already very intense precipitation. This is the exceedance of the 99th percentile. This is the worst rain in your region uh, over a year. And when that's a pretty intense precipitation event. As you get warmer, um, what we see is, is uh, a little bit more. If we held to the Paris Agreement, you know, our very extreme precipitation events are going to be worse. However, if we warm further than the Paris Agreement, these two lines start diverging and we start seeing in the red, this is the 99.9 .9 percentile. This is the rarest of the rare rain event today. I mean, it's so rare and it's so much rain. Now, if you get much warmer than a half or right now, nationally determined contributions around three degrees Celsius increase above pre-industrial temperature, these start diverging and it would be rain that, that our infrastructure, our buildings, what was built in the past really don't have much experience with. And we as planners, or, or caring about cultural heritage or the communities we live in, it is really dangerous uh, to think about warming the world more than what the Paris guardrail, Paris Agreement guardrails are. So that's bad news on the front of the hydrologic in places where it, rain is occurring. Now let's switch to um, what the changing rain patterns mean for the communities we live in um, and the types of, of um, grazing and forage material for livestock. Um, and, and these are just different classifications for the areas that are heavily grazed, um, re, um, areas that are grazed a little bit less heavily, the cropland and livestock, very intensive agricultural activities, uh, a little bit lower, but then uh, where we live. And then, um, so these areas that have crop and vegetation that are dependent for livelihoods, economic, um, importance to region are also changing. So this is looking at the changing in precipitation and rainfall and temperature on sorghum and millet. And this illustrates an important thing. The IPCC graph is talking about what if you change 
um, the precipitation uh, a little bit. So if, if you increase the precipitation, you get into this box here, really this whole range, but let's add temperature to that. Let's increase the temperature a degree Celsius or two degrees Celsius. And you see that what happens is for sorghum and millet at these West Africa six, uh, 35 stations in West Africa, what you're seeing is that you can have a de decrease of zero to 10% in these quadrants or as much as 10 to 20%. So basically the hotter the temperature, and if your rain is still similar to today, you are going to lose um, the, the crop yield of sorghum and millet. Whereas if you increase the precipitation and you have just a little bit of temperature increase like the Paris Agreement, you can sort of maybe manage losing none to maybe 10% of your yield. But as soon as you increase the, the temperature and you have uh, less precipitation, you start really getting into troublesome uh, lands. And so we're seeing that in human migration, people running out of food and, and um, no longer able to cultivate uh, the crops that are so important for living. So the other aspect is as you're warming the atmosphere, we're increasing uh, the des de desertification. So you can see that Africa has these regions that are hyper arid, arid, semi arid, or dry subhuman. And these regions with climate change, we're expanding the area of, of aridification. And within those regions, we may be transitioning to a drier uh, category, which is um, really challenging for cultural heritage, intangible heritage, as well as uh, livelihoods. So why is this happening? Um, this is a, an interesting graph. If you have a crop or if you have vegetation um, that you may be eating directly or maybe forage for livestock, what we see is, look at this, this is the case, 50% relative humidity. So the number of, of uh, water vapor molecules and the number of non, you know, the, the, the capacity of this atmosphere to take up more water are these open circles. Um, you see that in cooler air, you can see that th there's less of these water vapor molecules because when it's colder, you can't hold as much water vapor. Um, and so you have less water loss from your vegetation or your soils or if you have a structure, an earthen structure or a thatch roof um, from those structures. But when you warm the ocean, I mean, when you warm the atmosphere, you've now created that more of these, see these uh, open circles, it's telling you that you can, this atmosphere can take up more water. And what happens is the leaf will lose more of its water through evapotranspiration and the, if there's not enough water at the source in the soil, not, not enough rainfall, then this vegetation, of course, is going to dry out. The crops are going to get parched. The livestock are going to not have their forage. And it really creates a really um, vicious feedback amplification of drying out of our soils and our food and for forage for livestock. So think about that when uh, thinking about the cultural heritage um, sites, such as the Sukkar cultural landscape and um, some of these processes that are going on here. So I know I'm, I'm uh, have um, my 30 minutes, I have the last seven minutes here, looking at the history of species change um, historically, but more importantly, looking at the future of species change um, in the region. So one of the reasons uh, the Paris Climate Agreement has this aspirational goal of only warming the global temperature one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels is because species are among the biggest, um, you know, losses that are looming out there. And already we have had some, some endemic extinctions in parts of the world. So here's, here's, here's to show that every half a degree of global warming Global mean surface temperature really matter. This is from the special report 
IPCC on 1.5 degrees. So what I'm gonna show you is the, is the species lose over half of their climatically determined geographic range for global warming. If we warm the world one and a half degrees warmer than pre-industrial, that means that the habitable range, 50% loss of the habitable range for about 10% of insects would occur, about 8% of the plants, and about 4% of the vertebrates. Now, if we were to warm it another half a degree to the upper guardrail of the Paris Climate Agreement, you're nearly doubling those numbers for the percentage. You're losing much more habitable area for the insects, losing much more habitable area for the plants, losing much more habitable area for the vertebrates. So the geographic ranges of habitability are shrinking. And I'm gonna use Kilimanjaro as an example. This is from um, the African Journal of Ecology, hemp, published in 2006. These climatic zones in the southern region of Mount Kilimanjaro, and this zone right here is the coffee and banana plantation in the submontane and lower montane zone of the southern slope. And what we see in Kilimanjaro, if you increase the temperature and you um, change the amount of rainfall, and you're losing your glaciers on the top, uh, you're changing the climate of Kilimanjaro and where is the habitable zone when you are already on the slope of a mountain? Many times do you have the ability to really move that far up slope? If you move up the slope, you're shrinking the area because the mountain is getting narrower at the top. You're moving into just a smaller zone and so as species are moving up slope or to a different latitude on the planet, often these geographic zones of habitability for thriving are shrinking. So this is an example for coffee and banana plantations in Kilimanjaro. This also is very critical for uh, the marine species such as off of Kenya and, and other parts, many parts of Africa have thriving cor coral reefs that have experienced already climate change where heat waves are causing uh, bleaching events and things like that, which really is devastating to corals. And if there was an, uh, at one degree C world, we already have the coral reef suffering, but the IPCC special report projected that a decline of further 70 to 90% of warm water coral reefs, if we get to that one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial, which is what the Paris Agreement is striving to do. So we are really, really in trouble with warm water coral reefs. And so thinking about cultural heritage, sites that are in locations that the site may be here. This was in AD, early parts of 50 AD, when this shipwreck happened, think about the region around a cultural heritage site. Um, it may be changing dramatically because of climate change, such as if there are any coral reefs or any other types of changes in, in fishery species in the area. Okay, real quick, we'll go to close with sea level rise. As everyone's aware, um, it has been rising with the current level of climate change. So this is the historical map. Just focus on this part of the figure. Um, you'll see a general pattern of how much sea level rise, relative sea level rise, it happened in 1996 to 2015, relative to the 1901 to 1920 period, what we see is that the central and southern African coasts are experiencing closer to 150 to 200 millimeters of sea level rise over that period. And the um, northern uh, African coasts are experiencing closer to say 150 to 200 millimeters of relative sea level rise. Um, we'll look at Zanzibar here and here's Alexandria tide gauges. So um, what, what about the future? So we know that the ocean heat content, the oceans are warming. This directly contributes to sea level rise. Also, we have loss of land ice um, from our, the Greenland, Antarctica and the um, glaciers of Kilimanjaro and other um, mountains in Africa and around the world. And this is contributing to sea level rise. Now, the historical period, we are right here. 
and we've already experienced sea levels. Look at the difference in out to 2300. And this is what's really important about climate change is that we are, what you dial in with temperature, you dial in with sea level rise. And if we continue on the high emissions pathway, we could have three to five meters of sea level rise. And many scientists think these, even these assessments may be an underestimate because of what's happening in Antarctica and Greenland, um, especially the West Antarctic ice sheet. And that's, um, it's not evenly distributed. These are from the middle of the century. This is almost the Paris Climate Agreement. This is what nationally determined contributions of the future and the high emission scenario. What you see is when it's higher emissions, even by mid-century, again, you see a little bit more sea level rise, certain parts of the coast of Africa compared to some other, other parts, but it's pretty high. Um, at the end of the century, all coasts around Antarctica, but you're seeing some parts that are going to have much more sea level rise if we if we went this current high emissions pathway, which we want to avoid. And we know that such sites such as Kilokiswani um, are looking at how do we plan for the potential future pathways of uh, sea level rise. And I think I've come to my 30 minutes here. So I thank you so much for everyone, uh, the project partners and the funders for making it possible and for uh, being invited here to join you today. Your stories, um, sharing of the climate change at your sites are truly profound. And um, I look forward to uh, working um, through the rest of the course today. I'm gonna hand it back to you, Adam. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so, uh... As I'd like to, Brenda cannot be with us here today, but I certainly would like to thank her for, for preparing that, which I think um, really frames uh, our next presentation uh, from Mr. Abraham uh, uh, particularly uh, well, and we're really looking forward to that. And before I hand over to Mr. Abraham, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge um, uh, Mercy, who has joined us. She didn't hear me before. Hello, Mercy, welcome. Thank you, Willie. Hello, thank everyone. You. Great, thank you. Um, Mercy, I was wondering if you'd like to just say a few words um, and then we'll hand over to Mr. Abraham. Okay, uh, just two things. Uh, everyone uh, who attended this uh, important meeting uh, concerning climate issues for Sokol site, uh, which found in Nigeria, also Kilwa Kisiwani, Songo Mnala. Um, this is very important uh, because uh, climate changes is a big issue, uh, especially in cultural heritage sites. Um, the site which is located close uh, to the island. Other sites are affected due to sea uh, wave action, like the last presenters uh, who already uh, presented the climate issues, uh, but other sites are affected uh, due to uh, other weather, uh, weather actions. So it, it is uh, very important to us uh, we as Tanzania uh, to, to get uh, knowledge through this meeting on how well to conserve and preserve our cultural heritage sites. I know through this meeting, uh, we can find the mitigation measures and uh, like a mangrove plantation and other measures uh, so as to rescue this heritage sites which are much uh, impacted with the climate issues. Thanks to presenters and thanks to everyone. Mercy, thank you very much um, for that, um, which really kind of summarizes so many of the key, the key things we're talking about here today. Um, Mr. Abraham, if I, could, if I could pass over to you now, um, and maybe you could just introduce yourselves and give your presentation, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to, to share my screen.
So, uh, first of all, thank you to the, uh, the webinar organizers uh, for having me. So, my name is Zebra, as introduced. Uh, I'll be together with Dr. Mwamboli from the University of Dar es Salaam. I'm based uh, at Sokoene University of Agriculture in Morocco, Tanzania. And uh, my work has actually made, been made easy by Dr. Uh, Brenda because everything that she, she explained they actually set the foundation for me to to be uh, to be actually uh, easy understood when it comes to uh, models. But I thought it's very important for me to to introduce some of the, these basic issues because uh, I understand we are from uh, different uh, background, archaeology, climate, and all that. So I thought it's very important to introduce some of the these basic issues. So when I uh, say the projection, actually the simulation of our climate system uh, will be uh, in the future. And the response of the climate system uh, will be based on the certain scenario that we set. And these scenarios are actually called representative situation pathway. They are adopted uh, in the IPCC to seven seven report, and the, uh, before that we had the uh, emission scenario. So you can see the equivalent of this uh, scenario. So the RCP eight point five uh, actually kind of matches with A one four emission scenario uh, before two zero zero seven. So the emission scenario of the RCP is actually the, the trajectory of how Greenhouse gases concentration be, uh, into the future. So, for example, the 8.5, this is a, a, the best case scenario. That means we assume that the emission uh, continue at the year right now. Uh, the emission of fossil fuel, you know, that will continue as it is. And this is one of the uh, uh, very relevant uh, scenario uh, as far as the Africa project is concerned. Uh, but again, intermediate scenarios, uh, 4.5 and 6. Uh, uh, so we, the scenarios, we assume that we have a kind of action to actually mitigate the changes in terms of uh, uh, climate. So you can see at the, the worst case scenario, uh, we assume that the concentration of the greenhouse gases will continue to rise into the future approximately to 1,370 carbon dioxide equivalent to 2,100. But again, you have the other scenario up to uh, three, uh, the peak decline, where we assume that the greenhouse gases concentration will actually uh, peak, but decline before 2,100. Now, what are the models? The model, we may say, for example, before you construct a house, you may have a small, uh, small house or a model of that house, which can actually uh, tell you how the house will be looking like when it's, it's completed. So you're saying that the model is actually kind of a small replica of that we all uh, think. But um, so, so, so the, the, the model will be actually detailing how the uh, processes uh, within the climate system changes and uh, to give us now the, the output. But we are saying uh, every physical model should actually have as much as possible, the detail should be as much as possible to the real uh, 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 world. Now, going up. Uh, to, to the kilo of this one, because we, we, I think we all this that's located in southern part of Tanzania. And the climate is highly regulated by the ocean, since the properties are actually very close to the, to the ocean. And the mean annual rainfall is approximately 1,200 meters, with the uh, temperature between 18 to 32 and the area acidic are 30. Theory. And July marks the coldest uh, uh, months, June, 
Now, what does the projection tell us about the Kiswahili heritage site? Now, the CMIP5 for the Focal Monitor Comparison Project Phase 5 actually shows that the warming will continue uh, in this region where Akiwa Kiswan is. This is uh, and by 200 and uh, by 2100. And uh, actually, you can see that the monthly anomalies is higher for the worst case scenario, the 8.5, uh, compared to the uh, intermediate scenario that is the uh, 4.5. So you can, uh, I hope you can see my pointer. So this is the the anomaly, the deviation of the temperature from the the mean. So you can actually see uh, the the different time frame. So for example, uh, from two uh, two thousand and twenty, uh, you have so twenty twenty two two thousand fifty nine, you have the RCP eighty four point five telling us that there will be a 0 0.85 warming above the, the, the mean. So you can see across the models and across the time frame, different time frame, there is a positive anomaly. That means the temperature will actually increase above the, the baseline in Kiwa Kisua heritage site. So you can see the, uh, the, the at the end of the century, we expect the will about three degrees uh, Celsius from the, the, the mean. But again, in terms of uh, precipitation, uh, we are saying that the precipitation will actually decline by uh, 2050, but it will again uh, start to increase to the end of the century. You can see the the illustration showing us that from the baseline, from the mean uh, rainfall, there will be actually an increase uh, by, by, of course, by different values depending on the time frame. So, if we take, for example, at the end of the century, you can clearly see that there is an increase up to 25 millimeter of uh, rainfall. And the increase is very consistent in the January to uh, uh, this month is actually marks the, uh, the 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 time in the year where the maximum amount uh, of uh, rainfall. But again, uh, for the heat waves, we can see clearly that uh, for the eight point five, the, the the high emission snag, we can see clearly that there is increase in heat wave by approximately one, uh, 160 days uh, in that time, time frame. But in terms of wet spell, they are increasing, of course, into the future, but there is no consistency even if you refer to the uh, wet spell. So other, other, other parameters, such as the uh, sea surface temperature, uh, uh, are indicated to increase across the South uh, West Indian Ocean. Uh, and there is a warming of 1.5 a decade in the Indian Ocean, which is uh, actually very high compared to the global uh, uh, sea surface temperature uh, warming. But again, we, we know that when the sea is warm, it is, the, the sea, if the sea has more than 27 degrees uh, uh, Celsius temperature, that means we are actually facilitating uh, increase in convective activity, and thus we should be expected to have more of the tropical cyclone, the tropical uh, storms in the coming coming decades. And this is uh, very relevant because uh, recently we had uh, the tropical cyclone in Jobo. And the two years back we had Kenneth. So the this tropical cyclone is actually becoming more frequent. And the reason is if the sea surface temperature is conducive, it's above 27, that means you are the, the right environment for 
uh, for the formation of this uh, storm. So the last um, the last uh, tropical cyclone to make the landfall was actually I'll show you a bit later. But it's like uh, it's, it's very fortunate that the the last uh, tropical cyclone job what it did not hit the, the the proper region, but it was very close. So you can actually see uh, the the history of this tropical cyclone across the the, the, uh, the coast where our property is. So the the last cyclone to make the landfall was in 1952. Uh, which made a landfall in Lindy, but you can see that even to uh, 2019 we had a tropical cyclone Kenneth, and as recently we had tropical cyclone Jogo. So what I'm saying is that it's probably that in the coming decades we will witness more of this uh, tropical cyclone since the ocean is warming, creating a very possible environment for the formation of this tropical cyclone. In terms of now, uh, our heritage site, we it's likely to have what we call the storm surges when the tropical cyclone occur. Now it's up to us to discuss what are the uh, possible implications of these storm surges, heavy rainfall, which are likely to cause floods. Uh, what are the potential impacts and how can we actually address them? And then in terms of uh, sea level rise, it's projected that in the South uh, Ocean, we expect uh, a raise in, in sea level of about uh, 0.3 uh, uh, meters. And this is likely to occur at the end of the century. So you can actually, you can actually uh, see or compare the sea level rise at our property site uh, uh, with the global see a uh, projection to see where we, we are. Now, the, the model actually shows that the, the changes will continue in the future. And uh, so, for example, rainfall will increase, temperature will increase, and that means we'll have this extreme uh, event occurring, and of course, the tropical cyclone. So it's, it's, it's up to us to, to to actually brainstorm on a potential adaptation uh, option that we, we might want to uh, use so that we can continue preserving or protecting our uh, heritage uh, site. So having said that, uh, thank you very much for that. Great. Thank you. Um, so Abraham, thank you so much for that wonderful uh, presentation, which I think has just fed on really excellently from um, from Brenda's talk, just to focus in and get that kind of site specific um, uh, site specific information. And thank you also to Dr. Uh, uh, Paulina. Please send on our, our our thanks to him too. And I think it really highlights one of the key parts of the CVI process, as Scott said, which is that uh, it's science driven um, and. Uh, that's so important for us as heritage professionals who aren't climate scientists um, to get this background and this understanding uh, in climate impacts and not just uh, in a general sense, but this uh, specific emissions scenarios and how the different scenarios might impact um, on the sites. Um, the plan is to, is to have some questions at the end um, but before we do that, um, uh, I'd like to just uh, ask our final speaker, uh, Professor Kamamba, to talk to us uh, today. Um, it, it is uh, very relevant that we've just been talking about impacts. The first time I met uh, Professor Kamamba, I was part of the, the Google Heritage on the Edge project where myself, himself, Mercy and Bagumba were in Kilwa. Um, and it was a real privilege to be there with people who who knew so much about the site, uh, myself having never been there um, before. And uh, as I said before, as the ex director of antiquities, um, uh, Professor Kahamba has been very involved in initiatives at the site over the last couple of decades. 
and I think is in a very strong place to give us a, a bit of a, a background on that. So could I um, uh, ask you, uh, Professor Kalanda, just to unmute and, and speak to us for a little bit on that. Uh, yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be able to speak about the ruins of Kirua Kiswani and the ruins of Songumnara, a World Heritage Site since 1981. Uh, the Kirua Kiswani and the Songumnara uh, has been there since for many years, but it was on the World Heritage list in 1981. And then in 2004, it was put on a danger list. Now from 2004, I will take you through in a very brief way, and then maybe uh, propose on things that I think would be done. As a practitioner, uh, I think the site managers and authorities of Kiwa Kiswani will start looking into this climate change and see what can be done uh, as a proposal I'll be submitting. Yeah, coordinator, Thank you very much. World Heritage properties are a product of the existence of the 1972 UNESCO Convention, which was adopted in Paris, France in 1972. The loss through deterioration or disappearance of any of these most prized assets constitute an impoverishment of the heritage of all the peoples of the world. Parts of that heritage, because of their exceptional qualities, can be considered to be of outstanding vessel value, and as such, worthy of special protection against the dangers which increasingly threatens them. Third parties, I encourage to become part of the convention. And to date, there are 194 state parties to the convention with 1,153 properties on the World Heritage List. When a property that is inscribed on the World Heritage List is threatened by serious and specific dangers, the World Heritage Committee considers placing it on the list of World Heritage in danger. Considering this just mentioned action, the ruins of Kirakiswan and the ruins of Songomnara were put on the World Heritage in danger in 2004 because of a number of threats. These threats have some climatic background or base, basis. So it's upon the scientists and the experts on climate change to try and see if these such dangers can be, can be eliminated or can be mitigated. One of the reasons why Kiwa Kiswani Songumnara were put on the way they had in danger was the growth of vegetation and the plant infestation on the ruins, particularly at Uzunikuba, the Great Mosque, Makutan Palace, Marindi Mosque, Usundogo, and the Songomnara Palace, and the Degreza Fort. The vegetation was a threat because the ruins are not roofed. The second aspect of putting QX swans on the way that it is, it was the question of water penetration and the infiltration, particularly at the big monuments, which have no roofs. A lot of rainfall, as it has been cited by the previous speakers, is a threat and is still a, was a threat and is still a threat and it will remain a threat. The third element was the deterioration of the architectural heritage fabric 
due to natural degradation and the structural failures. We have a number of walls collapsing. We have a number of remaining parts of the roof also collapsing. And this is because of issues of water penetration, also plants infestation. The issue of sea wave erosion from the ocean wave action. As it has said before, this is the most notorious danger to the city wall, but also to the structures or ruins that are very close to the ocean. The issue of encroachment due to human settlements, trying to find places where they can put up their housing is also another issue. And it is being threatened by the need of more farming and the probably more cultivation coming into Kiwakiswanu, activities that were not formally very common. But there was a question of lack of involvement and the participation of the local community. This is not a question of climate change, but it has, it has some basis that could be uh, related to climate change because this particular involvement of the local communities have some education to give us, have some knowledge that could help us to understand how the climate change phenomena has been going in Kiwakiswani and how they have been addressing uh, such, such situations. As a response to the significant threat, the property that it faced due to the deterioration of the architectural fabric, due to the sea wave erosion, due to the weak management system, and the, due to lack of management plan, the committee decided to inscribe the property on the list of wave heritage in danger in 2004 in order to allow international donors to effectively assist technically and financially to conserve the property. Conservation is the management of change and the climate change is also to be managed accordingly. What actions were taken? This decision of listing the QRS1 and the ruins of Songo Munara with the heritage property led to a marked improvement in the management and the state of conservation of the property. As a result of substantial progress, it was later removed from the list of weather in danger in 2014. As per decision 38.7a.27, with the support of the UNESCO International Assistance approved in 2013 and the 15, important conservation work were undertaken to strengthen the coastal sea wall to the west of Malindi Mosque and the attack cemetery down to the Gaza fort in the Kiwakis one to protect these structures from the static tidal wave action. The tidal wave action was a threat, a serious threat to the western part of the old city where we have a city wall, which was being actually eroded, but we also had the Gaza fort, which part of it had been eroded away, and we had the Malindi Mosque, which was also being threatened by the sea wave action. But with the support of UNESCO and the international community, a lot of activities were put in place to protect the, 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 the ruins. Now, in 2016, a new integrated management 
plan was developed and approved. Its implementation plan contains, contains 18 targets to support effective management of the property, enhance its governance and the sphere sharing activities related to income generation for poor families. So this integrated management plan is trying now to come up with activities that will also attract and allow the local communities to participate and to involve themselves in the conservation of this ruin. The plan also proposed to establish a participatory management system to engage the communities and the stakeholders to improve visitor management, to develop a maintenance plan, and to consolidate all monuments. Now, having seen what happened in 2004, putting the site on the danger list because of the threats, having come and seen what now happened, some remedial works were put in place, activities done, and the, the site was removed from the danger list. But climate change challenges are still there, and the issues of management are still there, and the issues of protecting and conserving the monuments are still there. For that matter, I am proposing uh, the following activities which I think with the project we have at hand of climate change and with the involvement of the local communities and the local experts and international experts, I am suggesting a number of activities that could be done to make sure that the property, the way they had property is safe. One is to develop and implement a strategy for adaptation to the reality of climate change at the property and to effectively implement the integrated local management plan. It's a fact, it's a true fact that the climate change is there. So we should find and develop a strategy on how to adapt the situation. The second I'm suggesting we develop and implement a communication strategy to encourage sharing of knowledge in the face of best practices, research, public and the political, political support, education and training, capacity building, and the networking. I find these issues as crucial to the understanding of the climate change by linking scientists, experts, and making sure that we also learn best practices from other places. I'm again suggesting that we develop and implement a monitoring, reporting, and a mitigation mechanism of climate change effects through environmentally sound choices and the decisions at Kirakitswana and the Songomnara where they take property. This is also very important. We have to monitor the situation and we have to, make, to be making reports on what changes we see as the, and as the issues of climate change. I'm also proposing to encourage and empower a site manager at the Kirakitswana and the Sogom Nara where they property to the extent possible and that we did the available resources to monitor relevant climate parameters and to report appropriately. So it's also important to put up climatic parameters and then we monitor them. But the site manager has to be empowered, has to be encouraged, and has to be uh, uh, provided with resources. I'm also suggesting that we develop and implement a strategy to reduce non-climatic change factors on the property to enhance the resilience to climate change impact. There are other places that are not part of the climate change. So if we can eliminate this, 
then we leave more time and the more resources to climate change, which is more complex. But I'm also suggesting that we do identification, implementation, and the promotion of the synergies between adaptation and the mitigation. That is also very important because any adaptation must have uh, mitigated mitigation measures around it. I'm also suggesting that we conduct climate, climate change vulnerability analysis, risk assessment, adaptation, and the develop appropriate mitigation and the management plans. And for that matter, I'm, I'm commending the guy, Everest, who presented from SUA, that, that is the kind of analysis that should be done at the QX1, and that will be able to support the practitioners to be aware and knowledgeable on the dangers that are coming out of climate change. I'm also uh, encouraging the empowering, developing, and the implementing tailored site based pilot projects at the QX1 and from NARA in the development of successful and appropriate management climate change responses. So there must be, I'm suggesting, to have projects locally, uh, uh, tailored projects at the QX1, and they still uh, work on the climate change responses uh, using local communities and working with local communities and the scientists, of course. But I'm also suggesting that we encourage international cooperation with other conventions, instruments, and institutions through linking national local points of the various conventions, instruments, institutions, and the programs so that they can share and they can work together to see where there are synergies and opportunities in other conventions and the, uh, instruments. But also, uh, this international cooperation uh, should be looking into ensuring that Training courses on the risk assessment, reporting, meeting preparation, adaptation, and the monitoring are well coordinated. And again, I'm also proposing that I'm also proposing that uh, we collect and document information on the impact of past and the current climate changes on the site. We, all, we need to be putting this information on a record. We should keep this record correct because it will be useful now, but also in the future. But I'm also suggesting we review previous periodic reports as it could lead to the identification of past impacts of climate change on the site, which may not have been attributed to climate change at the time of the original report. There are issues that were reported back in, this, in a 10 years or 15 years ago, but this report might not have been uh, assigned or related to issues of climate change. I'm also suggesting to do assessment, continuing effectiveness of traditional skills and the use of traditional materials and the traditional practices in light of climate change as a basis for developing proposals for adapting them to cope with climate change. Uh, it's true and it's a fact that climate change is not a new phenomenon. Climate change has been there since the world was created or was developed or was made to be. And this has been happening of years and years. And I'm sure people staying, working in the Kiwakis one might have some experience as to what has been happening traditionally and what has been their responses. In the conclusion, therefore, I'm saying that the project proposed is very useful to the ruins of Kiwakiswane and the ruins of Songo Munara with the property. And it is important to note the proposed future action so as to make sure that the project benefits the property, communities around, as well as the nation. Therefore, the involvement and the participation of local site managers, local experts, international experts, local government and the communities, and the young experts is a prerequisite requirement. Thank you.
thank you very much um, for that really uh, thorough overview and um, particularly some of those suggestions towards the end, um, uh, which just seems so in line with what our project is, is, is trying to do. And for me, I think key to your, your presentation, which is so relevant to both our sites, is that these are not just past heritage sites, they're living heritage sites too, with communities that need to be incorporated and, and empowered into, into what we're doing and uh, into management and just the need for that ongoing management and, uh, and monitoring and planning, thinking to the future in terms of adaptation. Um, so thank you very much. And um, thank you to all our speakers for sticking so well to time, um, uh, which means that we have 10 minutes now. If anybody has any questions, you could either type your questions into the comments bar or please feel free uh, to uh, maybe just turn on your camera if you'd like to ask um, a question or if you're worried about your connection, you can just put your hand up um, or unmute yourself and I'll come to come to people. If I could start maybe while people are, are asking a question um, and ask Mr. Uh, Abraham something. Um, uh, one question I had, you, you had a, a graph that showed that there was going to be a decrease in rain, but then uh, uh, per year, but then the graph showed instances of much heavier rainfall at certain types of the year. Did I interpret that correctly? That, that there is, might be less rain overall, but there might be instances of getting an awful lot more rain, because that could have a quite significant impact on heritage structures. Thank you, Will, for a nice question. The, the, the more doctor detail that the decline will go up to 2050, but then after 2050, then we witness an increase in annual rainfall. And uh, mm -hmm. the graph actually showed that the uh, much increase is actually within actually the uh, three months, the January, February, and March. That's where the huge increase is. But Overall, in the uh, annually, the increase for uh, there will be an increase. Thank you very much. I mean, that's very relevant to what Professor Kamambo was talking about with return to um, water penetration, um, uh, specifically. Scott, you have your your hand up. Um, Uh, thank you, Will. I, I'd firstly like to say thank you to all of the presenters uh, and I've um, been very uh, privileged to hear the information presented and I'm grateful for that. So thank you uh, for all of the background work that has gone into that as well. Um, I too have a question for Mr. Abraham. Uh, and again, I, I thank you for your presentation. Um, in your eight, in slide number eight, uh, you showed some uh, projected temperature information. And from that, it appeared that, uh, I, and I want to check this, is there a, a change to the seasonal variation that is expected uh, with future conditions? Or, or was that simply a, a statement of the scale on the graph um, that I wasn't able to discern the uh, the seasons within the year. Um, and so even if you were to share that graph again, I would appreciate it. Um, your slide number eight. Uh, and, and is there a, a loss of seasonality in temperatures that is anticipated? Is my question. Let me share the, 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 the slides. Slide number eight. Yes. So the this is how uh, our temperature will be have uh, within the, the, the year, and this is how the temperature will deviate uh, from the, the mean. And the author was saying that uh, if you observe the the graphs, you will see that. Uh, 
at the end of the century there will, have, there will be a very high deviation up to three uh, degrees centigrade but then uh, in the near term or near, near future you can see that the deviation is uh, less than uh, one degree uh, centigrade now uh, i didn't uh, i don't did, did i respond to a question or your question was uh, about the seasonality of the temperature. Can you repeat the, the question? Yes, no, having having the opportunity to look again at these graphs, yeah. yes. um, and, th and thank you for that, I, I can see that uh, there are some changed patterns of seasons in yes. in some of the expressions, but I think that is mainly due to the changed scale um, yeah. that, that I'm looking at on on the graphs there. Yeah. So, so the, the 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 scale is uh, yeah yeah. So the scale is different for different graphs. No, thank you very much. That clarified that for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there's there's two questions, and I'm going to come to. Uh, the one in the comment which was there first which is from uh, Ningai um, and then I want to come to um, Aliyu Abdu who also had their hand up but Ningai you have asked Mercy can you tell us so far um, what did uh, physically do to mitigate the impact of climate stressors at Kilwa so what has been physically done Ningai if I've got that wrong jump in and tell me um, physical uh, adaptations, probably. It's correct. Great, thank you. Okay, Mercy, over to you. <laughs> Sorry, Mercy, I think, um, I think you're on mute. Um, Apologies. Okay. Hi. Hey, you are Mercy. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. I think she asked on how we take actions uh, to rescue the monuments which are close to the oceans. Uh, what uh, currently we are working on a mangrove plantation, especially to the open areas where the runes located to the along the ocean. This is what we did. But also we uh, we do a restoration to the Gabion, to the Gabion Wall uh, along the Geleza Fort, where the Geleza Fort is uh, much close to the ocean, and uh, its wall is impacted with the wave action. So the mitigation measures we took uh, is mangrove plantation. Yes, thank you. Great, thank you, Mercy. Um, I'm looking up a, a link from a project that Mercy and I were involved in a few years ago, and I will share it in the chat as well. Um, so, um, Aliu Abdu, you had your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, coordinator. Uh, I don't know whether mine is a question, but uh, I think it's like an appreciation for this opportunity that I have to get insight on the uh, you know process of the CVI working, and especially you know the sites uh, of uh, uh, Tanzanian sites, uh, and also to also to comment uh, on the uh, previous speaker. I don't know which the earlier speaker who uh, insight into the impact, the climatic impact, the rising temperature as it affects the uh, production um, um, and millet. Now, I, I think this is quite relevant to some 
world heritage sites especially those uh, cultural landscape uh, interaction of the people there the community with the natural uh, environment is uh, very uh, important is very uh, in that regard i am looking at the effect of this rising temperature as she has uh, as she has indicated in how the adaptation or you know towards the uh, towards the you know agricultural practice in of, uh, sodium and millet uh, may involve you know introducing new variety of such crop these varieties uh, may have another impact in the way the uh, are used in terms of uh, the uh, residences, you know, uh, use the constock that were used for the uh, uh, residence for building for, for building purposes, especially in terms of roofing and other things. You know, simply that the new crops that are being introduced for shorter stock which is not convenient for the use in the in the housing uh, development, the, the vernacular architecture of the site and all this. So I'm just looking at the, uh, you know, uh, adaptation and also the impact of even adaptation somehow. But uh, overall, I'm looking at the cultural landscape, uh, other cultural landscape that uh, quite similar impact of the climate as in the uh, Tanzanian uh, sites, which are other monuments that are, are being the sea waves and others. So thank you very much. I just to uh, appreciate on, on, on these presentations. Great, um, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Abdu. That's a really key point, I think, about not just about adaptation, but also the risks of, of maladaptation and, and needing to get it right, especially in cultural landscapes. And um, I have a couple more questions. Um, I would like to come back to Professor uh, Kamamba, because I know he was um, Director of Antiquities when a lot of the adaptation measures happened at the site. And there's a couple of questions about about those. And then after that, Eugene had a question for uh, for Scott. So, uh, Professor Kamal, could I come to you, please? Uh, Professor Kamamba? Yeah, uh, yes, sorry, I, I was I was in, I was muted. <laughs> Easily yes. done. Thank you. Yes, uh, the, the issue, the issue of uh, trying to trying to sort out the problem of climate change in Ikiwa uh, was 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 quite difficult. It was quite difficult in some places we could not get solutions. But as 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 Messi said, one was to work on the uh, mangrove plantation so as to slow down the speed and the strength of sea waves. That was one. Secondly, it was the issue of trying to put on gabion walls. Gabion, gabions were created to protect the, 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 the walls, the city wall that was directly being impacted by the waves, uh, the sea waves. So by putting up a gabion uh, and uh, putting up a gabion was, was, was also a challenge because we didn't want to create an eyesore at the at the front of the of the of the 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 the, 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 the island. So it, it was a it was it was a challenge because we had to do a lot of discussions. But finally, we did agree on the type of gabion that we have to put forward in the front of the Malindi Mosque and also in the front of the sea the city wall, so that when the waves come, they affect first the the gabion. But the third aspect we did on the structures, we're trying to consolidate the walls. You know, the walls had cracks and they had 
had had had had room for much water to penetrate, what a lot of water to run through the walls. So what we did was to consolidate the walls and to try to fill in the the cracks so that water will not infiltrate so easily. So that was another another aspect that we did. But the fourth aspect was also to put up a top a top a top a top layer on the walls on the on the foundations of the walls on the ruins to 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 get to make sure that to make sure that water penetration was reduced to minimum. But the fifth element was also to get to clear the the the, the plantations that were growing on on the walls, and that was also risky because. If you kill a, a, a big a big tree on a wall, it means it means when it rots, you create vacuum, you create a lot of spaces in the walls. And uh, we were very careful for those big trees. We just decided to 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 not to do anything to let them grow on the walls. Uh, but for the small ones, we could uproot them and fill in fill in the gaps. But also for the the, the 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 other ones we could kill them, uh, kill them, and uh, we 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 leave the roots into the walls because sometimes pulling out the wall the the roots meant pulling out some of the mortar and some of the stones. So we did such kind of uh, such kind of uh, of measures, but on the Sunikuba, it was more difficult, and uh, we thought it needed a high engineering work, and uh, we didn't do we did not do anything. There is a place where water goes into the into the Husunikuba, uh, ruins, and uh, then from the ocean it comes out. It has created a kind of channel that was uh, really really difficult, and uh, we had to get somebody, an engineer, who came. But the solution provided was not accepted, so we still have to to think on how to deal with it. Uh, of course, Husunikuba is still survives. But with that water going into it, it may be a future problem. Thank you. Thank you um, very much. And, and the experiences there that you were involved in and, and Mercy continues to be involved in, I think goes to show just how important knowledge exchange and sharing experiences are because the challenges I think you guys have been reacting to for the last few decades um, many, many, many sites are now going to have to have to respond to those. We'll finish up in just a minute. I just want to come back to maybe uh, one last question, which Eugene asked in the chat. Um, and uh, Eugene, correct me if I'm wrong, it's for Scott, and you're wondering about the new IPCC report and how it, it, whether or not it changes the way we do CVI. Is that correct, Eugene? Yeah, that is correct. And then uh, I added another rider, which is not for Scott, but for the second speaker on uh, the impacts of uh, the sea the rise on the, for instance, the Soko site, heritage site that is so quite a distance away from the sea. Okay. Could be the impact. Okay. Well, let's, um, uh, I'm not sure if we have super people here, but we, let's come to Scott first about the IPCC report, because I think that's really been the huge news item of the last few weeks, and many of us have been really quite shocked by it. So, Scott, could I ask you to speak on that? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'll, I'd like to start by responding to that second question. The, the Sukur site is a, a very long way inland, so sea level or any oceanic uh, stresses will not be uh, effectual uh, would be my my response there, um, just simply because of the geographic position of the Sukur site so far inland. Uh, so it's it's away from the ocean. Um, with respect to the latest IPCC report, the the sixth assessment report, the impact that it has is a new generation of uh, climate future projections. And so when we speak about the science-driven component of CVI, uh, it's precisely there, having this refined information uh, from a later, a more recent starting date for the models looking forwards, uh, provides us with updated 
information with respect to the climate stresses. Now, how that gets used in the workshop process or the snapshot or the consult, the, the application of the CBI remains the same. It's updated information that goes into that same uh, discussion place there. Uh, so um, as Will has alluded to in his comments, uh, the, the uh, how do you say, uh, the, the rapid advance uh, that is documented in this latest report is indeed startling and it spurs us on with even greater urgency uh, to undertake the actions and the work that we are pursuing. Uh, so so it's, it emphasizes even more the level of urgency with which we must understand and respond to the current and future impacts of climate change. Thanks, Will. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and uh, Daniel has just uh, actually said the next thing that I was going to say, uh, which is that our CVI participants will be aware that every meeting we do, we take a, a snapshot, a picture, a picture. So if people are able to, could I ask them to turn on their videos and we will just get a picture um, of, of everybody, if it's possible, if you're, if you're, if it will allow, thank you. Um, I appreciate it's not always easy, so. Um, Wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody. That's fabulous. Um, so uh, I am going to, I think, uh, as we say in Ireland, call it a day. Um, uh, and I just, I would like to, to thank all our, our speakers again um, for all your, your wonderful presentations, um, which were informative and inspiring and thought provoking and really everything that we wanted them to be. And it's always so exciting to meet with people in such an interdisciplinary way uh, of people coming from all sorts of different backgrounds from heritage and archaeology and climate science to have these conversations because I think it is in those dialogues uh, that we get so much done so thank you very much um, to everybody today and um, that's all I want to say Mercy would you like to, to mention anything or, or say anything? Uh, thank you Will uh, just to thank everyone for participating in this uh, forum, uh, our CVI program. Uh, thanks to Dr. Heron Scott for a briefing introduction on the CVI methodology. Uh, but also would like to thank uh, Dr. Adam Makam uh, for his presentation on the climate impacts on cultural heritage. Uh, we hear, we heard uh, a presentation on uh, about the regional climate impacts from Dr. Brenda. So, Dr. Brenda, uh, much appreciation. Uh, also, would like to thank Mr. Everest Abraham uh, for a wonderful presentation on the climate models for Kilwa Kisiwani. Uh, our director. Uh, Dr. Donatius Kamamba uh, would like to thank you on your presentation about the climate impacts and the response at the Kilwa Kisiwani. Uh, we saw uh, different questions, people asking on how uh, we took measures on how to rescue the monuments which impacted uh, with the climate issues and you responded, you respond uh, very positively. Uh, 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 we took different measures like in mangrove plantation. With mangrove plantation, uh, it helped to reduce the speed of wave action to go directly to the ruins. As we said before, that our most of our monuments are located close to the ocean. And the big issues authority is um, wave action because the wave action it goes directly to the ruins because uh, you can see mangrove trees so the wave it goes directly to the ruins and eroding uh, some uh, walls so with the mangrove plantation it means um, 
you can reduce the speed of wave sea wave action to go directly to the walls uh, also like uh, um, restoration of gabion wall as i said uh, in the Galeza 40 and uh, other monuments which are located along the ocean. We took measures like uh, that one. But also I uh, would like to thank uh, everyone uh, uh, for attending uh, this important uh, CVI meeting. Uh, I know we see this forum, we share or we exchange ideas and knowledge on how well to protect it our heritage, our cultural heritage. So to me, uh, this is a great opportunity. Kirwa Kisiwani, also our fellows in Sukuru Island in Nigeria. So thank you, Will. Thank you much. All right, thank you very much, everybody. And have a lovely um, day, evening, night, wherever and whatever time it might be. And I'm sure we'll see most of you and many of you again at future future events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kamamba. It was lovely seeing you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Why? Bye. Bye. Bye now. Review. Are you going to review? I'm not going bye to bye. bye now.